Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, 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 Hare Hare. So we are beginning, now we're beginning a series of talks called the Dharma of Women. I'm not sure how long we're going to continue. It will depend on the audience. And um, you may question my qualification for speaking about this, being a man speaking about women. I, I also question my qualification, but I, I think that the male perspective would add in some ways, uh, a slightly different view than the female perspective. I don't know if it's better, but it's different, so it adds some nuance to the discussion. And if you want to ask questions, which I hope you do, or if you want to direct where this conversation goes, if you get on the chat by I think you have to create a login and a password. And if you get on the chat, then you can ask questions. Because it's a big topic. And Alana asked me for a title for this topic. And I thought a possible title would be Natural Woman, What's Natural? And what I meant by that was, as society's values change, as society's customs change, as morals change, what we would call natural is only natural relative to that time and place, and not necessarily natural through eternity. So. Or, or as natural as <clears throat> a fundamental nature. Like what's the fundamental, like we say, the fundamental nature of fire is that it's hot. So when I say what's natural, then I mean what's the fundament, fundamental female nature as apart from the socialized female nature, which I distinguish as different. And it may be natural in 2016 for a female to be a certain way, but I thought it's important to, discru to discuss what is natural as a fundamental nature. And then, and then we can consider the relative merits or demerits of the social milieu at the present moment, because obviously growing up in the West, we, we grow up with specific values worldviews and education. So what we feel is natural is not that would not necessarily be natural if we were born and raised at another time. And even even today you can see what's natural in one country would be considered awkward or um, would be considered taboo, immoral in another culture. So when we come to Krishna consciousness, one of the things that we one of the things that we find is that it's not just a philosophy that exists in a vacuum, but it's connected to a culture. We call Vedic culture of Varnashram. And so sometimes if we try to understand philosophy without its practical application within a cultural context, we misunderstand it. And especially in regards to things that have been said about women by Srila Prabhupada or from Shastra, it can seem demeaning, it can seem harsh, it can seem prejudice, unless you understand the context of it. So, when, when we speak of natural woman, then I want to speak of it within um, a context, within a, a different context. Wow, hold on. I 
battery is low. Oh. Okay. Excuse me. That was... Okay, now we're plugged in. Uh, yes. So, if anything is not clear, just ask me to explain it because it. Unless you understand Varnashram and Vedic culture really well, it, it, it sometimes can be difficult to understand something that's in our scripture, especially something that doesn't make sense to you within the context and the experience of your life. So, for example, within the, within the context and experience of our life, there's not as much distinction between male and female as there is or was in other societies or more traditional societies in in terms of what's expected of male and women uh, men and women how they're trained um, whether or not they work the kinds of work they do the position of women in the home these things today are much different in your country <clears throat> than they were a hundred years ago. So um, we talk about, uh, there's a lot of talk about traditional values, like society is becoming immoral, we need to turn back to tra traditional values. So a lot of those traditional values are values which are different towards women than they are now. Traditional values were women were in the home, they weren't in the workplace, they weren't career oriented, uh, and especially not oriented towards owning businesses, running corporations, uh, in, involvement in politics, and, not, and not, not doing things that were traditionally male roles. Now, some women might say the only reason they were traditionally male roles is because the males wouldn't allow the women to take those roles in but it's not entirely i mean that's true that men wouldn't allow but that's not the only reason that women were not in these roles uh, women in traditional societies were not pushed to be in these roles and not being pushed they um, didn't really naturally desire it and it wasn't that they were fighting the men as as women feel today, we need to fight the men to get our place in society. You know, there may be validity in, in some cases to this where men are discriminating against women in a way which is detrimental to the well-being of women or to the management of, uh, of a group. But in traditional societies, women were not raised and educated to be part of that system. So the, the problem or the situation is that when you're educated to be part of a system where you more or less do what men do, then if the men do anything to put you quote unquote in your place, you'll feel discriminated against. But in traditional society, women already had a place which was in the home and they didn't feel discriminated against for having that place. That was just a place that was natural to them. But our society today, both because it's changed and because of the economic situation, women are now being educated just like men, and they're career-oriented like men, and they want uh, to be satisfied. They want to develop a career and express themselves, which uh, there's nothing wrong with that. What I'm saying is that in more traditional societies, that generally wasn't the aspiration of many women. Of some women, of course, but in general, it wasn't their aspiration. At least they weren't made to feel that there was something wrong with them if they didn't want a career. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with women wanting a career, but in more traditional societies, it was. It wasn't. They weren't trained that way. So it's. It's the women who wanted it had to step out a little bit and say, you know, I want to be a writer. 
I want to be part of this, I want to be an actress. Or, there weren't, the opportunities weren't there as much because the social structure didn't, didn't, how would you say, it didn't send the message. It didn't send the message to women that to be whole or to be, to be successful, you had to take that position. So I'm not saying that it's wrong that women want to take positions. And they're, um, they're obviously being educated for that. But the point is, when you read certain things in our Shastra about women, it could look like the men are exploiting women, the men are discriminating against women. If you don't understand the context of how women were living and the consciousness and the aspirations of women. Does that make sense? If it doesn't make sense, just um, get on the chat somehow or register for the chat and get on it. Because I, it, it, it didn't, when I was a younger devotee, it didn't make sense to me. Even as an older devotee, many things didn't make sense. And it, it required um, an understanding of the Vedic culture because the knowledge is, is coming out of that context. And context is how knowledge is applied. And if you understand knowledge without its application within the context that it was meant for, and then, and then it's hard to discuss or understand the basic principles so that you could apply it in the current context. Because just understanding it without the context of the culture that it came from, as I said, it may it may appear to be prejudice, discriminatory, and um, unjust, unkind, hateful, and so forth. So, one of the most uh, maybe maybe we need to start with with really what is probably the most concerning maybe most controversial of statements given in our Shastra, which, which un, if not understood correctly, if this is working, yeah, yeah, I can read, yeah. You're on chat, Andriana, Andri, Andi, Andi, the Andis, the and, Andi, Andi. Andi. Sanskrit, your name is Andi. In Australia, and your name is Andy. Right. Okay. So, um, what's the most controversial thing or, or the most concerning or possibly disturbing is this idea that women shouldn't have independence. They should be protected by their fathers. And... They should be protected by their husbands, in old age protected by their sons. Women are, quote unquote, less intelligent. Women are like children. And we've heard these things. They're, these things are found in a book called Manu Samhita, which is considered a Dharma Shastra or law book of mankind. And so when you hear that, it just sounds like okay, um, I want to be part of another organization or movement. I can't, I can't go around telling women that you're less intelligent, that unless there's a man guiding you, pretty much you're gonna, your life's going to be messed up. I mean, you know, that's not, it just doesn't make any sense. So we have to understand the context, and, and not only the context, we have to understand what is meant by intelligence, what is meant by protection? What is meant by women are like children? Um, because that sounds very derogatory. And if you if you study Vedic culture, you will see that women are more well taken care of than they are in our culture. So that seems contradictory because our culture would not demean women by calling them less intelligent. Of course, that may still go on in some places, but women, you know, they work side by side with men. 
they don't always in the workplace of course men get paid more so there's still a little bit of that but obviously not to this degree that your boss won't say well actually I'm paying you less because you're less intelligent he's paying you less basically because he can get away with paying you less because that's the culture at least in America women make less he's not going to say you're less intelligent you're childish and you can't make good decisions and you have to live you have to follow a male decision I'm not going to say that and if anybody says that 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 would be almost considered abusive or maybe not almost maybe it would be considered abusive so Prabhupada is not coming from the position of exploitation that we as men uh, well, that we as men want to exploit women, take advantage of them, and therefore we have these rules uh, and ways to keep them in place. Shama Sundari, the problem with my chat is it only reads one sentence. And I don't know, Guru Nishta, you can figure out why I only get one sentence. So what you said was, what happens when in the cultures, um, which are close to Vedic culture, and then... I can't read anything after that. Maybe that's your... Cultures which... Um, if we're raised in a culture which is closer to Vedic, then you'll more easily understand things. And certain things that will upset you now won't upset you because if it's more like Vedic culture, it's more normal for you. For example, um, there, there's... I don't know if this is a good example, but it, it does illustrate it. There are forms of education where there's high levels of discipline. Even, um, you know, very, very, teachers could be very, um, very abusive. It could be seen as abusive by language. Mm. Okay, I'll answer, I'll answer your question. It, it's getting a little ahead, but... Um, we'll kind of go in circles to, to answer your question, but I'll answer it. So, if if you have a teacher who's you know, calling you stupid because you didn't do well on your homework or your test, or really getting heavy with you because you're always a minute late to class and embarrassing you in front of the class, or even maybe using physical punishment, like you know, getting a stick or a a paddle and then hitting you in the rear end. In America, I'm not exactly sure, but I think you could take that teacher to court, especially if it was shown that that, was, that had psychological ill effects on you. You could take the teacher to court and you probably win. In um, traditional forms of education, students accepted the role of the teacher as a disciplinarian in a disciplinarian role. And I'm not arguing whether that's good or bad. It probably has some good and some bad. And I know I've asked devotees who went to schools like that and they said it was actually good for them. Probably not good for everybody, but for them they said it was good because we were just rowdy, misbehaved kids. And because the teacher was heavy. It actually helped. He, this is what he said. It helped me tremendously. In a traditional Indian schools, you know, the, the teacher is a bit of a disciplinarian, and they accept that. And they accept that it's good. I don't know if there's been any research on it, but I'm sure some people think it's not good. But whether it's good or not good, is not a question. But generally, as far as I understand, people are raised in those situations they don't really have a problem with it because that's it's just they're in that consciousness that the teacher has a right to do this that it's good they accept it my father used to slap me in the rear end sometimes and i just thought well that's what he does i never held, held it against him or hated him for it i just thought i must have done something that upset him so that's how i was raised and my daughter is, wasn't raised that way. I never did that to her. And if I did that now, 
Why did you do that? That would, she wouldn't understand it. It's not part of the culture she was raised with. Like, you know, what is my father doing? He's abusing me. He's destroying me. So, in when we, when we had American boys in our schools in India, and the teachers used that Indian discipline, the Indian students were fine with it, and the American students took it as abuse. It was the same action, but the cultural paradigm is different, so they saw it differently. So, my point is that when you hear things like women are this, women are that, it can be seen as very abusive coming from Western culture because we don't talk about women like that and we don't. And the problem is when Prabhupada's saying these things, and the point I'm making is we don't actually understand what he's saying. We're taking it in terms of our culture. So if, if, if we say women are less intelligent, that, that just means we're demeaning women, um, we're making them second-class citizens, we're maybe using the saying that to exploit them, you understand what I'm saying? Um, it will be seen in a very negative way. But as I will explain in a moment, it, it's actually the opposite. That in Vedic culture, women were protected. And those statements were all indications of socially how the male-female dynamic worked and how women were protected. And in that social dynamic, you would never, or it would be rare, that you would find women feeling oppressed. Now what Chandra Sundar is saying is, what if the husband takes advantage of the position? So that, that's exactly where we stand today in our modern society. If, if we say women should be protected, and I think any woman who has a good husband will be very satisfied. Yes, the husband provides materially, provides spiritually, provides morally, takes care of her, takes care of the kids, the woman will be happy with that. And a woman won't feel if uh, that it's, it's derogatory to say that I'm being protected by my husband, because she has a good husband and she's happy that he's taking care of things. All the things that are difficult for her to deal with, he takes care of. So. The problem is that when you don't have leaders like that, husbands like that, teachers like that, gurus like that, politicians like that, any leadership position, then you have to start defending yourself from the people who are supposed to protect you. And then those traditional cultural values for women, they can't be applied because if they are you're at a risk of being taken advantage of because the context of the culture in terms of the men or in terms of the protectors was not as it was at the time these things were spoken thousands of years ago in Vedic culture. So, yeah, so Eddie's saying it's hard to do this. Well, this is the reason it's hard to do this because as you have experience, Eddie has a lot of experience that if you're submissive to men, they take advantage of you. Right, Eddie? I mean, she told me that. Yeah, I said, I told her, I told her, um, she needs to develop her female side. And, and, she, and her reply was that I'm afraid, or in the past, when I show that female side, which is more submissive and humble, then I'll be taken advantage of. So, I acknowledge that and I recognize that, and that's actually the problem we're dealing with, that, that many, um, many of you ladies find it necessary, either consciously or unconsciously, to be more male, to protect yourself from men who are the ones who are supposed to protect you. And so unless they are male, you cannot be female. So I, I understand that, and that's part of the problem. But I think, I think before we understand it practically and how to apply it here, 
that let's let's first understand the principle within within an ideal culture or a Vedic culture of why why these things are said, and then we can go to stage two, which is okay. How are we going to deal with this in in this present society where men are not really men, and therefore women can't be women? So my personal experience of Prabhupada saying women are less intelligent, at least, um, um, yes, Eddie wears a dress, so she still looks, at least she still looks like a woman, woman, right? So maybe because she looks like a woman, there's a chance men will treat her like a woman. Yeah, that's good. There's always a chance there's some man who will treat you like a woman. So, a lot of the challenges that I personally have have had in understanding our philosophy, and I'm sure you have also, is that we might read something from Shastra, or Prabhupada might say something, and then we say, well, that doesn't make sense to me because what's being said here goes against my experience in life. I, I don't experience it that way. Right? So, for example, women are less intelligent. Right Now, I... Um, Eddie is a scientist, biologist, and I, in my science classes, I didn't pay attention. I wasn't interested. I, I don't know if it's, I don't have a scientific brain, but probably, I think by inclination, I would not be, be do well as a doctor or a biologist or chemist. It's just, and so Eddie has the intelligence, the brain, the inclination for that. So in that area, she's more intelligent than I am. Uh, and as I often say, you, if you needed heart surgery, would you choose a female heart surgeon or would you choose a male butcher? Because a butcher also does, you know, and he cuts meat. And so obviously, you wouldn't say, well, women are less intelligent, so I will take the male butcher because men are smarter. You would say, I would, if there's a choice, I would take the female surgeon who's trained to do heart surgery. Correct? So, so then I'm looking, and I, and I have a sister, and my sister is very intelligent, and sometimes she gives me advice. My wife is very intelligent. Sometimes she gives me advice, very good advice, something I didn't see, something I was blind to. Uh, in school, I remember to this day when I was 17, we had a Chinese girl in our school, and her name, I, crazy that I remember it, her name, is, her name was Fei Lo. I don't know where Fei Lo is today. But whenever our teacher would ask a question, Fei Lo had the answer. She had the answer for every question he asked. Um, and I didn't have answers for every question. And I felt... Like, Fei Lo was way smarter than I was. So I never grew up thinking there was really any difference in the levels of intelligence between men and women. As I became a devotee, of course, I didn't have a lot of association with women. I had a mother, I had a sister, a few girlfriends. But after 45 years in ISKCON, especially counseling, I got to know, know more about women's nature, especially from counseling, because they would, they would express their problems. Um, yeah, so yeah, yeah, so like Eddie's saying, um, the other problem is men like to feel they're more intelligent than women, and if you get better grades than them, then they can't feel they're more intelligent, and that throws things off. So, um, so from from dealing with women, it just it just confirmed my understanding that we all have different natures. And there's some women that are really good organizers, better than I am, um, better business people than I am, better in managing money. Um, <laughs> to make things better, Eddie said, I failed exams. Keep him happy. Um, no, you should have told him to take up. Uh, take a hike like one way for about a hundred years and passed all your exams. That would have been better. 
anyway, so so now Prabhupada's saying women are less intelligent, and and I have to have faith in my spiritual master, and I have to have faith in the words of Shastra, and I don't see with my eyes that they're less intelligent. Now, one time Prabhupada said, and you know, some devotees presented arguments. He said, he said, Prabhupada, it's just that women were restricted, so they weren't they weren't allowed, they weren't pushed forward to be scientists, to be writers. And so Prabhupada acknowledged that. He said, and then Prabhupada said, but generally, the male brain is more scientific, more philosophical. And I've seen that. I've seen that, and I was in San Diego, and um, there was a whole group of scientists there from the Bhaktivedanta Institute. And um, they really give these classes that are very highly scientific. And all the men were just very, very interested in it, and the women weren't as interested in it. So I could see when you get to this level of science, not that no women were interested, but some of them, more men were interested, and some women would say, I didn't really understand that. More women would say, I don't understand that. So I started, and, and Prabhupada said, and I also see philosophically, you know, men have a very, you know, they tend to have more philosophical outlook uh, than women. Not always, but more generally. When men come together, the level of discussion or what they talk about is often different from what women talk about. Uh, so, okay, then I, I, I saw that. Okay, there seems to be some general difference, um, but but it's general, and there's always going to be exceptions. And then I began to understand that one thing you see in Kali Yuga is you'll have brilliant women who are brilliant philosophers, brilliant scholars, brilliant scientists. There's, there's no question, right? And you'll have men who are not brilliant. They're supposed to be more intelligent, but they're not brilliant scientists. They're just car mechanics. That's what they are, you know. Or they're bus drivers. Or, you know, no offense to car mechanics or bus drivers, but you have these women who have capacities that the men don't have. So, uh, you know, a lot of what we're talking about are generalizations. But I would say, in general, men have a more scientific bent or philosophical bent. But it doesn't eliminate women. But one thing I noticed by counseling women is that many decisions in their life they had greater difficulty making than men more confusion or or more clear they, they didn't have the clarity that men often had and I'm not saying men are, are always clear but in general it seemed that the kind of counseling I would do for women was a little different than the kind of counseling I would do for men and obviously because men also because men and women see things differently but but one of the one of the problems that kept coming up again and again in my counseling with women was their poor choices of partners that, that, that so many women when a man would say I love you I have feelings for you I want to take care of you they would they would um, how would I say that because that's what they wanted and that's what they needed um, they accepted that um, and, yeah, so Eddie said in her science class are mostly men. Um, they were attracted to the, to the men, but there were other things that I would see, as they would describe those men, that to me were big red flags that you should have never been with a man like that. And this was very, very common. And in fact, I became aware that there were many books written about this. And one book is called How Not to Marry a Jerk because women were ending up with jerks and then saying, I'm in love with this guy and I can't leave him and he doesn't work and he uses me as a sex slave and this, that, and the next thing, he comes back drunk. But I love him and I would and I would think, it doesn't make sense to me. To my male brain, um, that doesn't make sense to me. 
ending, I say, when women start to become, and then it ended. I guess you're still still writing. Okay. Um, it didn't make sense to me. Then I then I came across another book, and the title was Ten Stupid Things Women Do to Mess Up Their Life." Interesting book, and it, it was the same kind of thing. What the book is about is relationships women get into with men who are not actually quality men, and why do they do that? You know what's going on. And this was very, very common. And, and to me, as an objective observer and a man, I'm asking them, why? Why are you with this guy? He's like this, that, and that. And they would just put their head down and they, they actually didn't have an answer or they would just say, I don't know, or I'm stupid. Or... Okay, so keep that thought. And of course, I'm generalizing here. I can't, I, you know... My wife is, I always say, my wife is one of the most intelligent women on the planet because so many men wanted to marry her, but she married me. So she didn't, it's a joke, but it's actually true. Because what I mean is, she had the discrimination to see a good man from a bad man. So I'm not saying all women are like that, but I'm saying... It's common that many women, they don't see. They don't see what a man would see. They don't see what a father would see in marrying a daughter. So, the one time Prabhupada was talking to a reporter and she was asking these questions about the female and the male and Prabhupada saying, you know, you should be protected. So naturally, for a modern woman, that's taken as very archaic and offensive. You know, we should have independence. You know, we're not smart enough to take care of ourselves. So Prabhupada was saying that what's happening in society today is that women are being exploited by men so that the men take advantage sexually and then quite often they leave the woman pregnant. This is very, very common which would not happen in a society in which women were protected because in a society in which women are protected it means the father would not allow women to have a boyfriend because having a boyfriend, being close, means that possibility or inevitably there is going to be sex and the possibility of getting pregnant by a man who doesn't want to marry you. So there, there was that insulation within society. So that's what Prabhupada meant by protection, and the women say, I want to be free. And so what Prabhupada said is, your, your freedom will be that you're free to be exploited by men. And so your freedom will be that you'll, you'll have sex with many men in the name of freedom, and then you'll get pregnant, and there will be no father for the child and no husband to support you, so you have two choices. If you want to keep the child, then you'll have to go on welfare, but you'll raise your child without a father, or you can have an abortion. So that was that was the point Prabhupada's making. And so she was arguing that no, we're intelligent, we're we're independent, and so on. And Prabhupada said, Yeah, but look what happens. That's not intelligent. If a man gets you pregnant and goes away, and you thought he loved you, but he has three other girlfriends. I mean, I this happens all the time. I love him. Well, well, why doesn't he marry you? Well, he has three other girlfriends. And he smokes pot. Okay. And you're, you're still with him. And he told me that when he's finished with the other girlfriends, he'll be with me. Okay, you're still with him. Yeah, I'm waiting. I mean, these are devotees. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. Do you need a father here to, like, set things straight? This isn't right. This is... This is um, this is not intelligent. So then, then it started to become clear to me that there's this emotional bond to the man and that emotional connection and feeling, whatever you're getting from him on the emotional level, is keeping you bound. And um, the intelligence is not 
in this situation, it's, it's for many women, it's not working. Not for all women, but for many of the women that I was counseling, it wasn't working well. So, I, so I'm looking at this, you know, and, and I'm, I have a daughter, and I'm talking to these women, and I'm thinking, if you were my daughter, number one, I would have never allowed you to get within 100 miles of this guy, and if you ever did, I would have sent him away 100 miles in like three seconds. I would never allow you to deal with him. And so I'm talking to these young girls who are the age of my daughter, and I'm thinking, where's your father? How, you know, who's taking care of you? Because on your own, you're making a bad decision. Now, you might say, well, is this just isolated to your experience? There's a radio show by the woman who wrote the book, 10 Stupid Things Women Do to Mess Up Their Life. And her radio show is predominantly single women calling in who have problems with men who are not taking care of them, who got them pregnant, who are having sex with them, who don't want to marry them, who have other girlfriends, who don't work, who are alcoholics, and like that. And so the person person who, who does the show, it's the same lady that wrote the 10 things, stupid things women do. Actually, that book is just, I think it's just excerpts from her show. She's trying to make sense with these girls. Like, like and I'll, I'll tell you one thing, it's quite funny. I think it's funny, but it's philosophical. So one girl calls and says, I have a boyfriend. We've been together for like three years, but he doesn't want to commit to marriage, which is common. Men think, if I get married, I'm tied down. So a lot of men don't want to commit. And also, you know, they're not sure this woman is the right woman. And if I commit, then I have no other possibilities. And, you know, that means I have to settle down. And maybe the job I have is not good enough to support a family. And I'll have to go to night school. And, you know, there's all these considerations. Where a woman's nature is that they want a family. So they're... As soon as the relationship is good and they feel it's there's some affection, they want to get married. So she would get many calls like this of women who are in relationships for many years with men who don't want to commit. So one of the questions she would always ask is, are you having sex? And every time they would say yes. And then she would ask this question, which would completely throw them off. And she would say, how much are you charging them? You know, what are you going to say? When a counsel, you know, you, you come to me, say I have a boyfriend, and he doesn't want to marry me, and I say, okay, you're, are you having sex? And you say, yes, yeah, sometimes. And then I say, well, how much are you charging him? What are you going to say? You're just completely bewildered. So what did she mean? So she explained. She said, you're having sex with a man who doesn't want to marry you. That's called prostitution. And then, if he's not going to marry you, you should charge him, at least you should make money from this. So, you know, she was joking, but her point was, you're prostituting, if you're having sex with a man who's not going to marry you, you're prostituting yourself. She's not a devotee. She's in her 60s, so she comes from a different culture. You understand? So then... I began to understand what Prabhupada meant by less intelligent. He didn't mean they're not good scientists, they're not good mathematicians, not this or that, that they don't know how to run business as well and manage. Um, but, he, but, you know, of course, that may be there in certain areas with certain women that may have certain tendencies that aren't, so as I said, so scientific, philosophical, and so forth. But I could clearly see that many, many women were just having the, the hell of a time to make, to be blunt and clear, making good decisions about boyfriends and marriage and responsibility and so forth. And then, as I was saying, I just thought, these women need fathers to help them and mothers to help them make this decision. Because on their own, too often they'll make the wrong decision. Not always, of course. We have um, sometimes when you make a bad decision, your next time around you make a better decision. But I'm speaking in general. So in Vedic culture, the parents were there to help the daughter to protect her from all these boys who are going to say, "I love you," when 
Actually, what they mean is I love having sex with you. So some girls I say, if the boy says, I love you, tell him, will you still love me if I don't have sex with you? What a great question, isn't it? What do you think he's going to say? If, especially if that's what he wants. Well, if I don't have sex, will you love me? Do you love me or do you love having sex with me? So, you know, you have to be careful. So the parents, the father, he can understand that. The girl thinks when the boy says, I love you, that he actually loves her. So I saw that in many cases, the women just, they couldn't, they couldn't understand that. And then when Prabhupada said, when the women said, we want to be independent, and Prabhupada said, the, ind the freedom you have is that you're either going to choose to abort the kid or you're going to choose to go on welfare. That's your so-called independence. And so she argued, argued, argued. But then after the conversation, Prabhupada spoke with his disciples and he said, therefore I say less intelligent. So that was Prabhupada's application of less intelligent. That the woman couldn't see that by allowing herself to have sex with any man she, want, she wants to have sex with, she's being less, that's less intelligent. And then Prabhupada said, the men are more intelligent because the men convince women that, you, that if you're liberated, you'll have sex. And therefore, the men didn't have to become married and responsible as they would in traditional society because you couldn't do that. You couldn't just have girlfriends in traditional society. So Prabhupada said, the women's liberation movement was actually designed by the men as a means to exploit women because now when women are liberated, they're free from the former constraints. And the former constraints are in the early 60s and 50s and before that. If, if women had boyfriends and they had sex, they were condemned. All their friends would condemn them. Everyone would condemn them. It was taboo. You wouldn't do it. So with, with women's liberation, then now they could do that. And so the men, well, this is great for the men. So Prabhupada said it actually was designed by the men to exploit women. But the women didn't understand that. No, in the name of liberation, being exploited by men, that, so Prabhupada said, therefore less intelligent. So that started making sense to me that in the Vedic paradigm, you have other people to protect you from men whose sexual needs and drive is so strong that it can completely control them and to such a point where they tell a woman, I love you and I'll do anything for you. But it's driven primarily by lust not by dharma. And that's why there's so much divorce. And a woman will have a hard time seeing that. When, when a man says, I love you, women fall apart. Oh, you do? Because naturally they want to be loved. And so they don't always see that, that love is not love. So um, I'm going to go back and read some of the things you said. Um, if you don't understand that or agree with that, then... Um, just ask me. Okay. Okay. So going back to, you know, Eddie's saying it's hard to be a woman in this society, I agree, because um, you kind of have to stand up for, women, for men. You have to stand up against men who would mistreat you. So, yes, yeah, so, so the thing is, if you if then you then you understand if I'm going to be a woman I have to be in a situation and I have to be surrounded by men who are who are friends and a man who is going to be or could potentially be my husband who's actually a man and don't ever get involved with a man who doesn't have the, who's not a man and it doesn't have the potential to be a husband and a father because then why are you involved with him just to have a good time. And that's, you know, that's where it's at today. Yeah, he's my boyfriend, he's my girlfriend. Well, what do you do? Well, we just go out and have a good time and get drunk and party. And that's not what a boyfriend is about. The boyfriend is about, can this man actually protect me? Can he be a father? Can he provide for me? Can he guide me? Can he be like a, a spiritual teacher for me? That's, or, or is this guy just, you know, immature? He's just actually a woman. He's just 
There's no difference between me and him. I'm more a man than he is. So that never is going to work. You have these relationships where the women are more men, male, than the man. That's not a healthy relationship. So, so um, I agree. You can't be a woman unless you have a man. And as, and as long as men try to exploit you, you'll have to stand up to them and you'll have to be very male. And you'll have to, you know, shut up, don't talk like that to me, etc., etc. Which is, That's not female. Female is submissive. So you can't be submissive to someone unless they're, they have your interest in mind, in heart, and they're pure. So that's, yeah, it's an obvious challenge. But at least if you understand this, I think then in terms of your looking for a husband, you won't just get bewildered by a man who says, I love you, or he's got big muscles, or he does nice kirtan. But you'll, you'll actually understand, realistically looking into the future, the next 20, 30, 40 years, the kind of man I need needs to have these qualifications. And then if he does, I can express my female nature. I, I saw that with my wife, that, you know, you all have this female side that likes to come out. Like, we joke with my wife, when we first met, and not when we first met, but after we decided to marry, and we began discussing, you know, what marriage life would be like. And she said, you know, I'm not like a typical wife. Her mother was also, you know, a working woman, and so she didn't have a lot of time to be a mother and wife because, you know, she had to work all day, as opposed to a stay-home mom. So, you know, she was raised that way, and she's a modern woman, career girl and all that. So she said, don't expect me to be a, a typical wife. Like, don't expect, don't expect me just to cook for you and like that. And because many men, they just want a woman who stays home, who cooks, keeps the house clean, raises the children like that. And now, that's exactly what my wife does. She cooks three meals a day, and she likes to cook. So... When we were first married, she was coming from more of that other culture of, you know, more exhibiting more male traits. You know, I don't cook and I work and I have a career and and through the years, it's been 23 years, now she's like really into cooking and being a mother in the house and, you know, and my wife was like this go get her save the world preacher you know go out and you know this project and that project and just do it um, full on you know and and now you know she hasn't done that since my daughter was born and she's not sitting in her room you know burning I can't wait to get out there and go save the world because she's in mother mode and it's so natural and I as the male sit in my room thinking the world's going to hell, get me out of here, I have to go save them. That's the male, right? So I just found that to be interesting. Um, so um, Eddie's saying she's trying to be a woman. Um, um, which is not always easy. And uh, as she said, her boyfriend didn't like her to get good grades, and uh, anyway, um, she had to fail her exams to keep him happy. That's pretty dysfunctional, okay? So, Andy's saying, when women start to become Krishna conscious, their intelligence gets stronger. Does this balance the emotional aspect? That's a very good question. Um, but let me just define a little bit more about intelligence because Prabhupada does, doesn't only define intelligence in terms of like if someone's more emotional that would be considered less intelligent not in terms of smart smart is different than intelligence so what, one common thing you find in our scripture is that when less intelligence is described or uh, ascribed to individuals, it's ascribed 
to people, or people are defined as less intelligent who don't surrender to Krishna. Less intelligent men, they don't know me. Less intelligent men, Naradamas, Mudhas, they avoid me, they don't surrender. Less intelligent men deny God's existence and so forth. So you have these big scientists, even Nobel laureates, very, very, like, very intelligent men, gifted by karma, with with brains that are you know, just uncommon. Most people can't even understand their theories and concepts and so forth. And then those people will use mathematics and chemistry to deny God's existence. So although I can't understand their mathematical equations or their chemical or physical equations, Prabhupada and Shastra is saying they're less intelligent, that we're more intelligent than they are. So you understand. So all of you ladies who become devotees, you're all more intelligent than all the men in the world who haven't become devotees. So that's one thing to understand. As far as, as becoming Krishna conscious, balancing the emotional aspect, I would say at least, at least we can say it gives you the potential, more potential to do it. It's not, I mean, your, your makeup, the, the male makeup and the female makeup emotionally are different. So your, nat, your emotional makeup, it's not going to change fundamentally, but how much it affects you obviously will, will change when you become more Krishna conscious because even though you're affected, you, you can understand. Well, I was upset, but I shouldn't have been upset. Or I was resentful, but I shouldn't be. Just like we have a forgiveness course, and we teach people how to forgive. Men, women, children, doesn't matter. So it's not that we think because women are more emotional that they're, they're going to hold on to their forgive, their resentment more, and it's not going to work. It's, it's not what I've seen. I've seen that the philosophy, when the philosophy is presented and accepted, then it can help them deal with it. Um, better. I, I, I don't want to say necessarily that it won't it'll be there less, although I'd like to say that, but still you have your you know, you have your physical nature as as a woman. But in theory as a devotee you should be you should be more controlled. We should all be more controlled. Now whether that actually happens will depend will differ from individual to individual. Um, you know, like, like some people just have a bad temper. And I'm sure there are many men who have bad tempers and many women who are, uh, don't. But for you women who don't have bad tempers, you'll probably hold things in, and then one day you'll just explode. And, you know, even if you're a good devotee, that's going to happen if, if you've been mistreated for many years and, you know, one day. So, but... Uh, another way of looking at it, say your downtime will be faster. You'll recover. You'll recover from your explosion faster. So, I mean, I'm answering this question based on my experience. That, you know, very women who are very advanced can get very upset. There's no question because you know, they still have that female nature. Prabhupada said female nature. Even he said it's the same everywhere. Even Draupadi and uh, I think it's Drop. Draupadi and uh, may have been Draupadi and the wife of Futurashtra. There was, you know, they, yeah, they just there was friction amongst them, and so Prabhupada said that nature is there. But I think as devotees, we're, we're able to better control it, either before that nature arises, control it as it comes up, but by nature it may still come up. Maybe not as much after it comes up, dealing with it better. And taking guidance from guru, from senior devotees, when you're married from your husband. It, it, um, I see in, in just my relationship with my wife that sometimes she'll, she, she'll need guidance and she'll, she'll, she's not thinking clearly about something. So she'll ask me, say, I need, I need you to, to, under, to you know, advise me on this. And, so I would tell her what to do, and she would say, 
Yeah, sometimes it's hard when you're not here because you just see things differently. And I need that male perspective. So, um, I think that's just natural. Even if you're very Krishna conscious. I mean, there may be... Um, maybe as we elevate ourselves more and more, we would expect that we will become more controlled, um, less pushed around by our emotions, that, that we'll be there. But maybe not as much and not as fast as you would hope, because, you know, you have that nature. I mean, that, that's part of the, the controversy about whether women should, should be gurus. So some, some would argue that, you know, that's a big position to have, and sometimes when you're in a big position, you get criticized, or some, sometimes in, in an emotional state, you may get very upset with a person or the disciple, and uh, we have to be careful, you know, that if a woman takes that position, she's above that. that I'm, not, I'm not saying that argument is necessarily valid, but people have that. They, they consider that, you know. But then I thought, but you could levy that argument against a man also. So, right? I mean, that's what you're probably all thinking. Wait a minute, why single us out as women, you know? A male guru can also get upset and irrationally chastise a disciple. That's possible. Um, um, so Eddie says, I'm sweet with my wife. Most of the time. Try to be. <laughs> so, Eddie's saying, in your life when you don't have someone to protect you, you have to learn how to protect yourself. Yeah, that's... That, that's, woman is protected by the father, the husband, and the son. Yeah, so you don't have to do that, so you can be a woman. That's the point. In traditional society, you could be a woman. And if we say you don't have independence, it, it's, it's, it's not like we lock you up and you can't do anything. It means that you don't have the kind of independence that would, that would, be destructive to your life, that your, your protectors protect you from the ill forces. You know, it's like one time Bhaktivedya Purnaswami, he said something very interesting, funny, but, but profound. He speaks a lot to the men to be good husbands, you know, what is required to be a good husband, much more than he speaks to the women. So naturally the question came up, why are you speaking so much to the men and not so much to the woman? Because traditionally in ISKCON, there's more, actually, there's more focus on the woman being a good wife than there is on the male, on the man being a good husband. And he focuses the, in the opposite way. So the question came as to why. And he said, the men are supposed to protect the women. I'm paraphrasing, I'm elaborating actually. The men are supposed to protect the women, but in Kali Yuga, you have men who aren't really men, so they don't know how to protect the women, right? So, now, I have to train the men how to be men who protect women. So, in other words, and this is what he said, that was just a preface. He said those other things in, in different contexts, but in this particular context, he said, he said, I have to protect the women from the men who are supposed to protect them. You know, it's like we have to protect ourselves from politicians who are supposed to protect us. So in Kali Yuga, we have to protect ourselves from the people who are supposed to protect us. So in training the men, that's my service. In training the men, it's my service of protecting the women because I'm protecting them from the men who could exploit them. And so, as long as you're in that situation where you're not protected by a man, a father, a husband, yes, it's harder to be a woman because you have to be rough and tough so the men don't just take advantage of you. Yeah, so I agree. And that's, that's why 
there's less of a distinct, or one of the reasons there's less of a distinction between male and female in our culture. Mm-hmm. Prabhupada was heavy, but he wasn't heavy. He was compassionate. And it's, it's seen as heavy, but it's actually compassionate. You know, it's just like if I tell my daughter, I'm not letting you marry that guy, he's a bum. That's he- what I said was heavy. And you think, what kind of father are you? Your, your daughter's in love with this guy. And I say, no, this guy's a bum. He's going to get her pregnant and he's going to leave her. And I'll bet every penny I have that that's going to happen. I'm never, you know, so sometimes as a father, you understand people and you understand what's going to happen. So you're heavy, but that heaviness is your affection. So anything that Prabhupada says, no matter how heavy it is, it's his affection. Right? That's where he's coming from. It's, you always have to understand that. That Prabhupada is not discriminate. Prabhupada is a self life soul, pure devotee. He doesn't discriminate between men and women. There's a nice... I'm going to add this little side point. You'll like this story. There's this morning walk. And one sannyasi, very heavy and fanatical, he was saying, Prabhupada, is it not true that all the problems that we face are because of women? No attachment to women. And Prabhupada didn't say anything. He didn't, he didn't want to discuss it. And the person kept asking. And so taking the walk. Isn't it true that you know, all the problems are created by women? Or attachment to women. Women, they don't create problems. But the attachment to women, that creates a problem. And Prabhupada's not saying anything. He's asking. He's, he's, he's asking again. Finally, Prabhupada said, yes, all problems are due to this, you know, attachment to women. And so, after the walk, they go to the temple, and like four or five women that stayed back to, to the, do the deity worship and clean the temple. And when they walked in the temple room, they were there to greet Prabhupada. And Prabhupada said something, I forget exactly, he said, you know, he was saying like, you know, all attachment and material entanglement is caused by women. So, you know, attachment to women keeps you in the material world. And, and Prabhupada said, but if you associate with these, when he saw the women, they bowed down, and Prabhupada said, but if you associate with these women, then you go back to God. It's nice, right? Um, so, that means devotee women are special. I don't know why I told that story. Um, oh, you're saying Prabhupada was very heavy. Oh, yeah. So I told that story to say that even though, you know, I don't, I don't think we should see Prabhupada as heavy. I think we should see Prabhupada as, as just telling, telling things as they actually are. Which, which, and that's heavy. You know, the material world's heavy, so if you tell things as they are, that's heavy. Right? Isn't it? Yes? Yeah, it is. <laughs> Bhagavad Gita as it is, that's heavy. Prabhupada, he's just, he's, you know, we have this word raw when someone just tells it like it is. So Prabhupada is very raw. He's not polishing it or, or spicing it up. It's just how it is. But but you need to know how it is to be able to deal with it. And if somebody teaches you and doesn't tell you how it is, then they're actually they're not compassionate. By not being heavy doesn't mean they're not compassionate. Now, the art is to be real, but to say it in a way that you can accept it. But sometimes the truth is so heavy in itself there's no way you can say it that's not heavy. It's just heavy. So, you have to, but you, if you understand Prabhupada's mood, his mood was, it's all about compassion. And then it doesn't sound as heavy. It sounds, those things sound compassionate. Um, um, and he says, I think that is a particular sex. I'm not sure what she's referring to. Mm. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's difficult to say how women are less intelligent, but um, this this general sense of getting themselves into trouble with men. You're very intelligent, and you've made bad choices about men. Yes. So that's so. Probably doesn't mean you're not smart. It means if you're not careful as a woman you'll be prone. And Prabhupada didn't say it happens to all women. They'll be prone to. Prone to be take advantage of men. And men, if you allow them, they'll take advantage of you. So that's the idea. Yeah. 
Um, and then he says, there's a saying, love is blind. And there's a funny saying, love is blind and marriage is an eye-opener. So yes, you will blindly fall in love and you'll get married and your eyes will open. And one day you will say, oh my God, is this what love is about? Yeah, so love, you know, we have a very romanticized idea of love. But we really have a warped understanding of love because it's so it's so clouded by lust. So that's what the meaning love is blind. Yeah, well, lust is blind. Krishna says that. You know, love is blind. Change that to lust is blind. Abhitam jnana etena. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, by lust you're covered. It covers your knowledge. So, um, Nick says, becoming a qualified man, qualified devotee, and finding a qualified woman, this is a state in our brain that makes even men and women don't see things clearly. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like, I don't want to be a bearer of bad news, but being married to your lover is not exactly a fairy tale where you live happily ever after. It's a lot of work, and it's a lot of growth required individually, and there are a lot of challenges, and there's not all the sense gratification that you think you're going to get. And, and the love that you're looking for, ultimately, it's from Krishna. And if your wife or your husband helps you develop that love, then your love for them is perfect because they're helping you become Krishna conscious. But in a romantic sense, sense you're going to be frustrated, and Grihastha life is full of challenges. So if we're, if we're realistic about it, and we're more dharmic and dutiful in our role as husbands or wives, then we won't be frustrated. Um, the scriptures have said that Kali Yuga women are more religious. Yes, that's true. Okay, so that will end on a positive note. Um, Prophets, and Annie's referring to, uh, maybe referring, she may be referring to a statement where Prabhupada said, at religious functions you'll find more women attending. Uh, <laughs> are women going to be more intelligent? Well, if they come to religious functions, they'll be more intelligent. But um, it's still not its still not how we're defining intelligence. We're, we're defining, you know, it depends how you define intelligence. S spiritually intelligent, if they come and hear Bhagavatam and Gita, yes, they'll be they'll be more intelligent than men. And the advantage that Prabhupada's pointing out is is that male ego, it's all about competition, strength, achievement, control. And the female ego, it's prakriti. So prakriti, it's about service, it's about nurturing, it's less about competition, it's like like when girls play, young girls, they play more together. When boys play, they play more against one another. So that's just nature. So the female nature is more about together. The male nature is more about outdoing one another. So that makes it easier for a woman because we're trying to develop prakriti, the female nature, which is the nature of a servant, the nature of humility. And so women have that more naturally than men. So that's an advantage. Right? Isn't it? Don't you think? How do you know how to choose the right husband? Yes. You go to mahatmadas.com, you scroll down to a banner that says something about Grihastha life, you click on it and there are five Word documents about how to choose a good husband. And if that's not enough, you can read the book, How Not to Marry a Jerk. Go online and check it out. <laughs> and you can ask somebody, you can ask somebody, you know, I, what do you think about this guy? What do you know about him? And you will not marry any man unless he listens to all 29 lectures I gave on Grihastha life, because a lot of those lectures deal with what it means to be a husband. 
And as I joke, that you should not marry any man who's not certified graduate of Mahatma's sacred union class, because if he's not, he could be dangerous. Seriously, he could be dangerous. He could be dangerous for you in a relationship. So he, you read, um, you go on my website, you read, and there are questions to ask the man. What if, what if, what if, what if? If I said this, if I did this, how would you react? How do you think about this? Because you want to know. And, you know, what do you think about women having a career? No, I just, I would just want you to be a slave at home. Okay, maybe that's not the right man. Maybe you want to be a slave at home. That's fine. Okay, I'm happy to be a slave at home. But you have to ask those questions. You have to know. And he has to know what it means to be a man. Because many men are not men. They don't know what it means to be a man. They're not responsible. They're not strong. They're not dutiful. They're lazy. They, they're not, they don't know how to listen. They don't know how to develop. They're not kind. They're very critical. They're very angry. You, you don't want to be around someone like that. And if you allow yourself to get attached to a man, then you won't see all the red flags. Because you're, you say, oh, he's so nice. I like him so much. And, and you'll see all the bad things, but you actually won't see them. That's the problem. You'll see them later on. Now you see them, you don't notice them because there's so much attachment. So you have to be careful. Don't get, don't allow yourself to get too attached to a man before you're sure this guy can be an amazing husband, an amazing father, and he ha and he understands what it means to be a husband. And he's, he's not whimsical. He's a committed person. If things get difficult, he's not going to run off. He's not the kind of guy that once he commits to me, he's going to, you know, if he, in a weak moment, he's going to run off with another girl. You know, all these things. You know, do as much as you can know. Now, Nick wants to know about the right wife. Oh, what are the questions? Well, just turn the questions around. Read the questions. I think they can be used. They're, they're, they're practical questions. You know, it's like, if I want you to stay home and work, stay home and just have a lot of kids, what do you say? If I want you to work and only have one kid, what do you say? If I want to, you know, take a job where I can make a lot of money and I'm working 14 hours a day, what do you say? What if I decide we want to, I want to live on the land in a mud hut, what do you say? I'm like this, this is my nature, what do you say? You know, these are the kinds of questions you have to ask. And um, asking the woman, like, do you feel like a woman? Do you feel like a man? If I'm the man, are you going to fight with me to compete to be the man? You know, so you're, you're like, you know, these are good questions to ask. Um, okay. Uh, what if the women in the movement don't get married? Will they need to develop, um, need to develop a something? Well, it's okay if they don't get married. If they're, if that's, if they can live that way, that's fine. I don't know what to develop a m means, but generally, women in our movement who don't get married still they have some. They'll have some man who's the temple authority that if they need, they can help him. A lot of these convents are actually run, started by men, and overseen, maybe not, they don't live there, but I think, I think that's true. I think that's what I've read or heard or seen. Um, I heard the Brahma Kumaris, which is a group of women, are, they have male managers just to help them. So, but the Brahma Kumaris, they're all Brahmacharinis. So Prabhupada acknowledged that it's okay if a woman can do that and wants to do that, there's no problem. Um, electricity went on. I'll check the recording. Okay. How are your sons? Oh. Oh, do I have any sons um, who are who will make good husbands? We're working on them. Yeah. Yeah, so then naturally people think, oh, I should marry a disciple of Mahatma because he trains his men. Well, maybe, maybe not, but you know, everyone has their nature, so I can try to train them. But you still have to see. Right? Okay, Kim, I can't seem to see the chat because you need, oh, you can't see it, but you're on it. Wow, amazing. Anyway, um, 
I don't know if the chat will continue after I log off, but I'm going to log off. I'm on my way to another town in a little while. So it was nice talking to you. And um, I'll be giving classes, I guess, the next few days. But um, wherever there's internet, then I'll just give the class. I'll just I'll do a Ustream of the class. And I will tell Gurunishta when I know, if I know. And sometimes it just might be a few hours before. But anyway, she'll inform you. So um, any class, morning or evening, where there's internet, I will uh, broadcast it. But here in the temple, the internet didn't exist in the temple room. I'm in the office now, as you can probably tell. Okay? So um, it would it'd be nice for the... I know you have a lot to think about, don't you, this class? This is such an interesting topic for a Western woman and a Western mind. Um, so think about some questions and note them down, and then we'll discuss in the next... The next class is going to be in a month. So, um, I, and if you have any doubts or if I, you think I said something that it doesn't make sense to you, just note it down. This, this is a sensitive topic, and I can see that sometimes... I might say something, and I'm saying it within a particular context in my mind, and then you're hearing it in a context in your mind, and then it it doesn't make sense to your context, but it makes sense to my context. So if something doesn't make sense, then, then ask, write, note a question. Now would be a good time. If there's something that's said today, note the question. Then. And then next time we'll discuss it, and then otherwise... We hopefully I'll be able to have I have to where I'm going, going to two places in the next week. So I just have to make sure that we can do our classes as scheduled Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Gor Premanand Tai Gor Premanandi. Jai Hare Krishna.